is Stand Up For The Truth, addressing important issues and topics affecting Christians across the nation. Greetings, it is Crash Connell. It is Tuesday, June 11th, 2024, and that means it is a brand new podcast. And today it's news and commentary with indeed. Mary Danielson. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's headline day, a chance to catch up with what the world is up to. Almost always no good. And we have enough to fill several page ones. I think we're somewhere in uh, page six by now. But um, there's so much to talk about. There were things I had to leave on the floor, too. So let's just jump right in. In that case, Scripture is Psalm 146, 1 to 5. Praise the Lord, O my soul. While I live, I will praise the Lord. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man, in whom there is no help. His spirit departs, he returns to his earth. In that very day his plans perish. Happy is he who has the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God. Amen to that. Pray with me this morning. Lord, we are ever learning about who you are and the depth and breadth of what you have done for us. We are grateful, Lord, but increase our gratitude. Give us even more grateful hearts, contented hearts, and work in us an attitude of serving you and those you've put into our lives. Lord, we lift up uh, today those who are hurting, who've suffered loss. Maybe they're just struggling to make sense of things in their lives, and we ask for a touch from you. Healing where needed, grace and peace to continue on in the midst of difficult times. Thank you for your refining work in our lives. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we ask for boldness to bring the hope of the gospel to all we meet, until you call us home. In Jesus' name, amen. Headlines for June 11th. June 11th is the 162nd day of the year. There are 203 days remaining in 2024. On this date, because you know I'm a history buff, Henry VIII married his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, in 1509. You may say, why should we care about this? Well, a, a bit of history rabbit trail on this. And it has nothing to do with that catchy little tune from the 60s about that king. Well, when Martin Luther posted his grievances with Catholicism back in 1517, King Henry uh, took it upon himself to become a public apologist for the Catholic Church. And the Pope at the time, Clement, uh, bestowed on him the title Defender of the Faith. But a decade later, Henry began to usher in another sort of reformation, which became one of the most far-reaching events in the history of England, all because he had a personal beef with Rome. His union with Catherine of Aragon had produced no male heir, and his eyes began to wander towards a a woman named Anne Boleyn, who was one of the ladies-in-waiting, and Henry had already had an affair with her sister Mary. Henry was looking for a dispensation to end his marriage to Catherine, saying she'd been married before and to his brother no less, and the lack of a male heir was punishment from God. I mean, double standards abound here, but be that as it may, the Pope refused to annul their marriage, so he married Anne Boleyn anyway and was excommunicated because, via his power as a king, he booted the Pope from England, became the supreme head of the Church of England, also called the Anglican Church, which was birthed at that time. And now Henry could do whatever he wanted. So he married four more times to seek a male heir, which he obtained by his third wife, Jane Seymour. But this move made him very wealthy. He seized all the land in England that uh, the Catholic monasteries uh, stood on. He seized their assets and used the money to fund wars abroad and pay off England's debts. Laws were then passed to enforce Protestant doctrine and Catholic bishops were imprisoned in London. So history from time to time will claim that this is the actual beginning of the Reformation in 1530, the part where Catholicism no longer rules England, and Catholics and Protestants will ever be divided in beliefs from that point forward. All the subsequent kings of England have been the head of the Church of England, including King Charles today, And popes learn not to make those kings angry. So there's some drive-by curbside history for you this morning. Let's talk about some old business. uh, During my interview with Jim Fletcher, that was May 31st, we discussed two very interesting articles entitled uh, The Secret Reason Hamas's Friends, Ireland, Norway, Spain, and actually Germany, are helping the Palestinians. 
That's Gatestone Institute. The second article that we discussed with Jim was Germany's woke government wavers as Islamists declare holy war. And that was from the Middle East Forum. So that first article from Gatestone, let me just quote them briefly. They say, in the past few days, Hamas and other terrorist groups have been rejoicing over the decision by Ireland, Norway, and Spain to recognize a Palestinian state. The terrorists are so delighted that they have released several statements praising the three countries and stating that the Palestinians view the recognition as a direct result of their terrorist attacks against Israel. Germany, not to be left out, said it would, quote, detain Benjamin Netanyahu if he were to set foot on German soil if the International Criminal Court, the ICC, issues an arrest warrant. The recognition of a Palestinian state, even if it's merely a symbolic action that has no bearing on the reality on the ground, sends a message to the Palestinians that terrorism against Jews is justified and worthwhile because the world, instead of punishing you, will reward you for your crimes. So that's the setup for that particular article. The second one, um, Germany's woke government wavers as Islamists declare holy war. Uh, This article suggests that they are filling a vacuum left by the destruction of ISIS. Okay, let me just read a little bit from this, and then we're going to connect a few dots here. More than a 1,000 Islamic extremists recently marched through the streets of Hamburg, Germany, Hamburg, Germany's second largest city, demanding that the European Union's most populous and powerful country be reconstituted as an Islamic state governed by Sharia. The demonstration, organized by a fast-growing Islamist group called Muslim Interactive, was allowed to proceed after left-wing parties in Hamburg's legislature rejected a petition by right-wing parties to prohibit the event. The audacious audacious display of Islamist power on German streets cast a light on the glaring double standard. On the one hand, the German government continues to trivialize and express solidarity with the totalitarian challenge to democracy posed by radical Muslims who openly seek to overturn Germany's constitutional order. On the other, the government is obsessed with the threats it says are posed to democracy by the anti-immigration alternative for Germany, the AFD. And we're going to talk about uh, this um, right-wing lurch to the right uh, because there are a lot of elections going on. Okay, so the AFD is that uh, right-wing group, the country's second largest political party, whose popularity is fueled by voters frustrated with the government's refusal to crack down on those very same Islamists. So that's just the setup Uh, for what uh, we're going to talk about here and a little bit of an update from uh, the program with Jim. Okay, uh, as I said, this article suggests they are filling a vacuum left by the destruction of ISIS. These caliphate supporters in Germany are not refugees, but mostly children and grandchildren of the immigrants born in Germany. They cannot be deported. So this this is really critical about what Germany looks like today. Now, my comment at that point was, there are close to 6 million Muslims in Germany. I find that ironic. God never forgets what is done to his people. And look at what's going on in Germany as a result. Is there a price being paid? You decide. Now, a very sharp listener of Stand Up For The Truth added her thoughts to the mix on this notion of six million Muslims in Germany. Let me set this up. My generation was the largest in U.S. history, so you would think that it would follow that my children, our children collectively, would compromise an even bigger generation than the post-war boom. Well, sadly, tragically, wickedly, there have been 63 million babies murdered in the U.S. since 1973. Okay, 2,300 children are aborted every day in the U.S., And a lot of people express the notion that God seems silent on this. Is he? Maybe we're not paying enough attention. Think about it. And a listener called my attention to this. That's close to 63 million Americans who could be filling jobs and voting. Could it be that God is sending us foreigners in record numbers, legal and illegal, who love or hate our country, to fill jobs and vote? Ouch. The daily number of immigrants and refugees alone who are invited into becoming citizens, ultimately, these are the ones invited in legally, is the same as the number of children aborted per day. The total number of immigrants in the U.S. in 2024 is 51 million. 
illegals conservatively at 10 million. I don't know if anyone really knows the number, but that's what they're estimating. That represents more than the population of 36 of our states. Here's a statistic for you. Within a few years, the total number of foreign-born people in America will be 60 million. How many children have been killed since 73? 63 million. Now, the left vigorously, constantly promotes the murder of our children, makes it the number one election issue. And then they themselves invite strangers and potential criminals and terrorists to wittingly or unwittingly take their place. Sometimes we have to do the math. Just put two and two together, I think. So thank you, listener, for giving us all something to think about and grieve as well. We welcome your comments on this or anything we cover at comments at standupforthetruth.com. I love to hear what you're thinking about uh, uh, headline days, guest days, all our days. So here's another set of interesting statistics to go along with all that. Uh, Leo Homan put out an article entitled, U.S. Birth Rate Hits New Record Low, But Media Refuses to Address It. He says, the latest federal data coming from Centers for Disease Control show that the fertility rate among U.S. women plummeted to just 1.6 births per women in 2023. This is the lowest recorded birth rate since the U.S. government began keeping such statistics in the 30s. Let's break it down. The drop-off in fertility rates for white women fell 3% from the previous year and stands even lower than the national average. The fertility rate is an estimate of the number of babies a woman would normally have in her lifetime. A rate of 2.1 births per woman is needed for a generation to replace itself. So we're going to add on to what we just talked about with the abortion rate. We are not even close to that. And all of Europe, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and Russia are in similar free fall. India, the African nations, and a few countries in the Middle East are pretty much the only ones experiencing growing populations. The most fertile childbearing group, young women, are putting off motherhood because they are uncertain about the future and they're spending more of their income on home ownership, student debt, and child care, according to the Wall Street Journal. An article posted by The Burning Platform notes that the reasons the journal and other commentators give to explain the decline in birth rates are the consequences of what took place in America and the Western world decades ago. Leftists have always wanted to break down and corrupt the traditional family. According to the article, uh, quote, a splintered and dysfunctional family structure would be less likely to act as a bulwark against the leftist agenda of more government interventions into the private affairs of its citizens. The feminist movement was more than just the attainment of quote-unquote equal rights for women. Its main objective was to lead women out of the home and away from their traditional roles as moms and homemakers. Uh, The record drop in birth rates is evidence of how well this plan worked. As a result, look at how much more empowered the government has become over the everyday lives of Americans. I would also not dismiss the impact that toxic mRNA injections have had on fertility. There have been a few studies that suggest these jabs have had a negative effect on the reproductive organs of both men and women. Of course, more work needs to be done in this area. One thing you can count on for certain, you won't find any government funding or or Gates or Rockefeller funding of such studies. They are all on board with the eugenics program to wipe out billions of people and get the global population down to one or two billion from the current eight billion. Also, Henry Kissinger, who is now face-to-face with God, called for a depopulation of the third world as far back as 1974 in the Kissinger Report. Also, Dennis Meadows, co-author of The Club of Rome, published the book Limits to Growth and Let the Cat Out of the Bag about the globalist elite plan for depopulation. Don't forget the interview in which Meadows said, I hope the depopulation will occur in a civil and peaceful way. Also, we can't have to add to this mix two-child and one-child policies in some nations, um, Asian nations, also um, the divorce rate. So it's just a perfect storm of so many different things. But I'm fascinated by the connection between abortion and um, foreigners coming into our country. So, something to think about. Okay, I'm gonna talk about the ICC, the International Criminal Court. Um, Although they lack true power internationally, they've been making themselves more visible of late with their arrest warrants for Netanyahu and other Israeli leaders 
for, quote, war crimes and crimes against humanity, end quote. And, of course, the U.S. and others responded with outrage, which they should. Also known as the World Court, they can rule on disputes between governments, but they cannot prosecute individuals. They have jurisdiction for crimes committed uh, on the territory of a state or nation which has ratified the ICC Treaty. Okay, that's where their power lies. Also interestingly called the Rome Statute. The head prosecutor is a Scottish lawyer named Karim Khan. I don't know about you, but that doesn't strike me uh, as a Scottish name. Just throwing that out there. Then we have an official statement from Germany saying it would detain Netanyahu if he were to set foot on German soil. That doesn't look good on them. <laughs> um, so let's talk about being on the wrong side of everything. On May 24th, we have this headline, International Criminal, Criminal Court Prosecutor Threatens U.S. Senators. And I mentioned this in a previous podcast, but I'm going to go a little farther because there's an update on this. But just to refresh your memory... This uh, article about threatening U.S. senators, that's a little gutsy. It says, um, this is <laughs> interesting. This article is from the Council on Foreign Relations, who I don't trust as far as I can throw. But this is very interesting. Many critics thought the International Criminal Court had gone too far when its prosecutor asked for arrest warrants against Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and Defense Minister Gallant. But as the saying goes, you ain't seen nothing yet. Now the prosecutor's office has threatened to prosecute criticism of himself, Mr. Karim Khan. Those who seek to defend Israel and stop the malicious, deeply anti-Semitic action against its leaders and against the Jewish state are now being told that their words and actions may also be a crime. Isn't that special? Article says this may sound like something out of Alice in Wonderland, but it is an effort not only to limit freedom of speech, but to limit the constitutional powers of the United States Congress. After the prosecutor called for the, arrest, uh, called for the arrest warrants of top Israeli officials, 12 United States senators wrote to the ICC. The final paragraphs of that particular letter read, If you issue a warrant for the arrest of the Israeli leadership, we will interpret this not only as a threat to Israel's sovereignty, but to the sovereignty of the United States. The United States will not tolerate politicized attacks by the ICC on our allies. Target Israel and we will target you. If you move forward with the measures indicated in the report, we will move to end all American support for the ICC, sanction your employees and associates, and bar you and your families from the United States. You have been warned. The reaction of the prosecutor's office came in a tweet. The key language is this. When individuals threaten to retaliate, retaliate against the court or court personnel, such threats, even if not acted upon, may also constitute an offense against the administration of justice under Article 70 of the Rome Statute. Wow. The 12 United States senators are, are already criminals, according to the ICC prosecutor, for writing their letter, even if absolutely nothing else happens. Note that the prosecutor writes of individuals who may threaten the ICC, whereas the senators write as a U.S. government officials about possible government actions. In plain language, the prosecutor is arguing that he and the ICC are above criticism. Forget freedom of speech or national sovereignty to say that the U.S., which is not a party to the Rome Statute, maybe he didn't read that, that they might react to punish the ICC for illegal and immoral actions and its employees may take is not permitted. Suppose for a moment that the U.S. Congress passes the new legislation the 12 senators threatened along, um, along the lines of the ASPA, the American Service Members Protection Act. Voting for such legislation, even if it doesn't pass, would clearly, in the view of the ICC, be a crime, a form of retaliation and threat prohibited to every in inhabitant of Earth, prohibited to every inhabitant of Earth by the Rome Statute. This guy's delusional. So much for the Constitution, national sovereignty, self-government, freedom of speech. The ICC apparently stands above all of that. Even for citizens in countries such as the U.S. who have not signed the Rome Statute. Israel has not either, by the way. This attempted power grab is breathtaking and should be summarily rejected by citizens and governments around the world. This effort to criminalize Senate action and call for a Senate and even a call for Senate action should have been met with immediate rejection by Attorney General Garland and President Biden. Oh, boy. 
Silence in this case can be interpreted as consent and much more is required. Um, one assumes that the judges of the ICC are not crazy enough to go down this road. Um, it was widely assumed previously that the ICC would not move even against a democracy such as Israel. So, that's interesting because there's something more now that has popped up here. House passes proposal sanctioning top war crimes court after it sought Netanyahu arrest warrant. So um, the House is moving on this. <clears throat> the, one, the 247 to 155 vote amounts to Congress's first legislative rebuke of the war crimes court since its stunning decision last month to seek arrest warrants for the leaders of Israel and Hamas. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the move was widely denounced in Washington, creating a rare, mom rare moment of unity on Israel, even as partisan divisions over the war with Hamas intensified. While the House bill was expected to pass Tuesday, it managed to attract only modest Democrat support, despite an outpouring of outrage at the court's decision, dulling its chances in the Senate. The White House opposes the legislation, calling it an overreach. Of course. Always speaking out of both sides of their mouths. That's this White House, always. Article goes on to say both the Republican and Democratic leaders of the House Foreign Affairs Committee acknowledged the bill in question is unlikely to become law and left the door open to further negotiation with the White House. They said it would be better for Congress to be united against this Hague-based court. State Department spokesman Matt Miller reiterated the, this administration's opposition to the sanctions part we have made it clear that while we oppose the decision taken by the prosecutor of the ICC, we don't think it's appropriate, especially where there are ongoing investigations inside Israel looking, looking at somebody's very same questions, and we're willing to work with Congress on what a response might look like, but we don't support sanctions. Both the ICC and the UN's highest court, the International Court of Justice, have begun to investigate allegations that both, both Israel and Hamas have committed genocide during the Seventh Month War. So... You know, nothing is set in stone here, um, but it's something worth watching. Um, Israel is not a member of the court. Even if the arrest warrants are issued, Net Netanyahu and Gallant do not face any immediate risk of prosecution. But the threat of arrest could make it difficult for Israeli leaders to travel abroad. And it ends with failure to act here in the Congress would make us complicit with the ICC's illegitimate actions and we must not stay silent. Senator McCall says, we must stand with our allies. Well, you would think. So that's interesting. The ICC uh, has no teeth. But let's build on this a little bit. While we were focused on the WHO pandemic treaty power grab, and I can't even read two articles that agree on whether that was successful or unsuccessful, that certain amendments were ratified, um, but no, it's completely dead in the water. So... People who do, are doing research on the same thing but coming up with two different angles. But I'm going to say that even if it is, quote-unquote, dead in the water, it's not. They're not going to give up on it. So it's not a, a one-and-done thing by any means. But while we were focused on that power grab, there's another power grab going on, and it is the ICC and the rule of law. This is, this, people might, might say the ICC has no teeth and forget about it, but don't do that. Alex Newman offers some insights into this. He has an excellent video called ICC Power Grab Could Put You in the Crosshairs. So I recommend that you look that up. The ICC claims to be investigating NATO. So this is the first time they've gone after an ally of the U.S. or a leader in a free country. Now this shouldn't surprise us necessarily because weaponizing the courts, they're just getting started. And what better example than the Trump trial? However someone views Donald Trump, in these times, the issue is never the issue. Please don't just see it as he did this or he didn't do this. There's so much more going on than that. Will that prosecutor be reined in? <clears throat> this is what people want to know. The House is looking into that. <clears throat> but really, in these times, should we be surprised since we're heading towards a tyrannical global government? And one of the casualties of a global government is due process. The complaint against Netanyahu, get this, was filed by a, the communist regime that currently rules South Africa. So it came from another country. 
What is this regime? A Marxist genocidal government that brutally oppresses its people, bringing charges of genocide against Israel. Huh. I guess there's no other genocidal governments in the world to go after. Wow. What about China? Again, Israel is not under their jurisdiction. This hypocrisy level is stunning. So who are the ones who actually set up the ICC? Syria, Venezuela, Sudan, Zimbabwe. Or as Alex Newman puts it, kleptocrats, mass murderers, gangsters, and tyrants. Just what we need to have make up a global court, right? With the ICC, you would have no right of representation, no jury trial, no right to a speedy trial, so find a comfy spot in prison and expect to stay. <clears throat> the threat is, of course, that these types could place us all under a totalitarian state, which we know is coming. It's just a matter of time. It is being held at bay. The Holy Spirit is the number one restrainer of evil in this world until the church is taken out. Also, our House of Representatives, um, they called him out, even if the Biden regime says they won't go that far with sanctions. But threatening our representatives, well, there's just more outrage than we can keep up with here. Because in the U.S., we have a constitution. We have a Bill of Rights. The rule of law is supposed to rein in abuses by the state. The ICC has no accountability or protection. The The potential for abuse of power is significant. Now, the U.S. cannot transfer our powers or laws to the ICC. If the U.S. were to be neutralized on the world scene somehow, that could give tremendous power to a global court. They actually believe they can override our courts if the U.S. would decline to prosecute some tyrant for whatever reason. So that's their vantage. That's where they stand. That is where they assume their power from, that they have a right to uh, override laws and go after tyrants. So really... National sovereignty is on the line in this and other ways as well. Now, the ICC is located in The Hague. What is The Hague? Well, um, in the Netherlands. Here's an interesting sidebar. The, The Hague is the international law capital of the world. It is the center of government of the Netherlands. 150 national law organizations are located there. I didn't even know there were 150 national law organizations. But their goal is to make The Hague the legal capital of the world. So that, that's, that's where they're coming from. It is also called the International City of Peace and Justice. That is wishful thinking. NATO Command and Control is also there. Europol is located there. This is a powerful, powerful city. That is the European police office, and they focus on combating terrorism, drug trafficking, money laundering, and fraud, uh, euro counterfeiting, and human trafficking across a borderless EU. So it is a uh, significant center of power for the European Union. That is worth watching when you hear The Hague mentioned uh, in a, a world government sense or a justice sense. We should perk up our ears. But the ICC is somehow thinking they're eligible to take on a power that, on paper, at least they are not. I say none of that matters because the globalists aim to put the squeeze on us all anyway by taking away our rights in any way they can, and things can change overnight. Alex Newman says, a massive power grab by the ICC could end up legitimizing this kangaroo body illegitimate claim to have jurisdiction over every person on earth, including you, Uh, warns the uh, editor of the New American Magazine. Neither the U.S. government nor the Israeli government are signatories to the statute that created this court. But under the guise of pursuing Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu for genocide, the court is claiming it has power to prosecute him despite the state of Israel never offering its consent. It is threatening U.S. senators, which we went over. So uh, very interesting. Keep an eye on the ICC. And when we come back... Uh, we're going to take a break. We're going to come back in two minutes. And Hal Lindsay, I'm going to wrap this up with an article by Hal Lindsay called Addiction to Despotism and some great uh, comments. It's very spot on on a slightly more local level, talking about government overreach 
via laws and regulations. So we're going to be back in two minutes. More of the headlines. The sun may be shining right now in Wisconsin, but now until July, inside the Rush Center, it's blizzard season. Hand off to Terrence Smith to the goal line. Touchdown, Green Bay. The Green Bay Blizzard are an indoor football team that plays in the IFL and are now excited to become a business underwriter of the Q90FM ministry. Loading up and throwing deep, and this ball is caught for a touchdown. Game schedules and more information can be found at GreenBayBlizzard.com. Green Bay Blizzard, supporting Q90FM. Q90FM presents the Police Lights of Christmas, helping over 70 police departments across Wisconsin. Each department is going to leave this night with a box full of thousands of dollars worth of gift cards. Visit lightsofchristmas.us. Police Lights of Christmas, a ministry of Q90FM. Feedback, questions, and topic suggestions are always appreciated. Email us at comments at standupforthetruth.com. Welcome back to Stand Up For The Truth. My name is Mary Danielson, and we are having a headline day. Um, I spent quite a bit of time at the beginning talking about the International uh, Criminal Court in The Hague, and um, they have sort of come out from the shadows and and flexed some muscle um, against the people of the earth, especially Israel and the U.S., of course, the free nations on earth, (laughs) two of the, and... uh, uh, our country and Trump and BB are always under fire because, uh, well, they hate our freedoms. But I want to end that segment. I just want to pull it into this segment a little bit with an article by Hal Lindsey that I think is just spot on. It says it's called Addiction to Despotism. This is his latest from Sunday. He says, the world's nations are being strangled by an ever-growing web of laws and regulations. So I'm The reason I'm reading this is this is what's behind a lot of this. This is the basis for this power that is just appearing out of nowhere. This this is the the web or the framework. Let me start over. The world's nations are being strangled by an ever-growing web of laws and regulations. It gets harder and harder to do anything without Big Brother's costly intervention. Productivity is held back just when we need it to increase. Quality of life is taking a major hit. There are multiple reasons for this dramatic increase in government overwatch. First, new and sometimes dangerous technologies are leaping into existence at every turn. They need legal guardrails, yet these complex new laws must be written and voted on by non-specialists. This makes politicians ever more dependent on experts, and experts tend to come with an agenda. While legislators are tasked with writing laws, the real work often falls to members of industry, ecology groups, or other special interests. Nevertheless, even long laws tend to be too vague. The Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare, is about 1,000 pages long. Supporting regulations brought that up to at least 10,000 pages. And some say, some sources say as much as 40,000. Lawmakers wrote 1,000 pages and regulators added tens of thousands more. And for us, all of it amounts to law. Just stop and think about that for a minute. Breaking laws that you don't even know exist? Is that the goal here? Because you could be hauled before a court breaking a law. I mean, I'm not talking about having a gas stove or an electric stove or um, a gas-powered vehicle or an electric vehicle, although it could come to that, I'm sure. But all of this, no matter how many pages, amounts to law. Okay, so let's back to Hal Lindsey here. This gives unelected bureaucrats enormous power. And more and more, the world's government bureaucracies have come to be run by extremists and activists, people drawn to an area of government because of their great passion regarding that subject. This gives extremists and activists enormous levels of control over countries and their people. Activists, perhaps nobly motivated, want to change the world. Too often that means they want to run everyone else's lives. No kidding. So government intervention grows to ridiculous levels. But here's another even more deadly reason for increased government, declining moral standards. As individuals lose their grasp of ancient verities such as honor, love, and compassion, government tries to compensate. They do this in order to keep society from falling into an abyss. At the end of 2011, the last year for for which I, Hal, could find numbers, the National Conference of State Legislators, Legislatures, put out a press release stating that U.S. and territories 
passed more than 40,000 bills and resolutions into law that year. Even though some of the resolutions are merely ceremonial, that's still an overwhelming number of laws, and it does not include counties, cities, or the federal government. At the same time, we have district attorneys who refuse to consistently prosecute crimes. They seem to want fewer people in jail and a smaller police presence in our communities, but they're creating cities where crime runs amok. Violence spills into the streets and seeps into homes. People are afraid in neighborhoods they once considered safe. Activist DAs may want fewer police, but their actions are already beginning to have the opposite effect. When crime is allowed to pay, the people become afraid. With enough fear, people stop worrying about their rights. They put safety ahead of everything. According to the Bible, peace and safety will be the primary issues of the last days. When chaos and fear rise like the floodwaters of a mighty tsunami, people begin to cry, peace and safety, anything for peace and safety. Peace and safety will be the mantra of Antichrist. It all begins with a societal embrace of sin and depravity that paints police as the enemy. It ends in an Antichrist-run police state where laws are not written on human hearts but forced on people from the outside. The loss of personal morals in the populace inevitably leads to increased governmental control and the destruction of human rights and human dignity. Well said, Mr. Lindsay. And now the outcome of 40,000 laws that no one knows anything about is enforcement by courts that have previously had no power, and all of a sudden they do. So that's something to think about. Let's talk about elections, and I don't mean ours. Not yet anyway. 50% of the world's population is going to be voting for their leadership this year. Just, uh, just concluding are the EU parliamentary elections. They just concluded on Sunday, in which tens of thousands of candidates across 27 EU nations are running to serve in the 705-seat EU parliament. That's a lot of people running for office. I can barely stand it when two are running for the same office. Um, this article uh, by, let me see where we're at here. Oh, okay, this is uh, far-right parties could undermine democratic values of EU if elected to the parliament. This year will test even the ro most robust democracies. Um, at least 25 places, a, ch uh, a change in leadership could resonate around the world. And it says, as half of the world's population votes in elections this year, voters are in a foul mood. From South Korea to Poland to Argentina, incumbents have been ousted in election after election. In Latin America alone, leaders and their parties lost 20 elections in a row until last weekend's presidential election in Mexico, uh, according to a tally by Steve Levitsky, a Harvard professor of government. And as you know, we mentioned here last week, a female Jewish climate scientist was elected to run Mexico. Now there's an example of change for Mexico, which is mostly Catholic. They've never had a female um, leader before. It says, this dynamic is likely to repeat itself as the EU launches its legislative elections this week, where conservative populist parties are expected to register gains across the continent. That's called lurching to the right. Why is this? Well, we're going to talk about that. EU parliamentary elections are usually an opportunity for voters in individual countries to vent their frustrations because the candidates they elect will have power in Brussels rather than their own national capitals. In the UK, Prime Minister Sunak called elections for later this summer in which his party is expected to struggle. The truth is, hatred for the progressive left is boiling over, all over. In light of this, many on the left around the world, or shall we call them progressives, because, you know, left and right uh, is, uh, the definitions can be different depending on what country, perspective of left or right. So we're going to call them progressives. Left and right don't always mean what they do in the U.S. But many progressives are worried about nationalism making a comeback. And I presume they mean by nationalism the opposite direction of globalism. And yes, they are worried about that. 
A Trump victory would likely then reverberate far beyond our own shores and far more than in 2016, because come on, the global elite have ramped up their power grab. And it's a far different world than 2016. Just think about how far different it is. So what happened in the EU over the weekend? There is indeed a populist nationalist movement going on in Europe. And I'm cheering on the inside. This article by Robert Malone, MD, is the same Robert Malone who uh, came against COVID and the vaccines. He's a very sharp guy. He has a Substack um, blog, I guess you call them. I don't even know if they call him that anymore. He's on Substack. So if you have the Substack app, you can find a lot of great writers in there. I've been on there about a year and I've learned so much. His is called, Who is Robert Malone? <laughs> so a uh, little, well, you know, self, uh, self-effacing their humility. But uh, Robert Malone is a very sharp man. And uh, we find on Substack people like Leo Homan, Jeff Childers, all of them. Some are for pay and some are not. You can get free uh, in your email box. And some you'll pay for uh, premium qual- premium uh, output. Center-right surges in European elections. He says, repeatedly returning to the states during the last few months after my travels and participation in fro- pro-freedom rallies and speeches in Europe, I've often been asked about how the populist slash nationalist conservative movement in Europe is going. Some emergent political parties, uh, the German AFD, which I mentioned. Now, when you say far right in Germany, eh, people get a little nervous about that, and they should, because far right and fascism are are two things that walk hand in hand. But when we're talking far right here, let me put a disclaimer on that, a little asterisk, if you will. When you are far left, which the progressives are, and so many uh, American Americans and American legislators are, Everything to your right looks like far right. We can't even talk about centrist anymore. Uh, But some of this is centrist. It just is labeled far right by various media groups. So you need a dictionary to even read the news anymore. So the German AFD, France's national rally led by Marine Le Pen. Oh, we're going to talk about her. Uh, Georgia, the government, uh, the state of Georgia, not the state, the country of Georgia, um, Brothers of Italy, that's, a, that's a considered a right wing. Uh, Belgium has the New Flemish Alliance. Romania has the AUR, and then there are many others. And, he's, and Robert Malone says they've been surging in polling, but the outstanding question was whether they would be able to convert this to momentum in the ballot box. These have all been labeled by the Trusted News Initiative, TNI, the corporate uh, press mob, as far right, but my impression after actually meeting and speaking with these leaders has been a more accurate label would be populist, nationalist, center right. So uh, he says, with the tip of the hat to U.S. politics, you might call this an emerging make Europe great again movement. Robert says, yes, in fact, last week's European Parliament elections were a stunning setback to the narrative of the unstoppable momentum towards globalism centralized planning and command economies, and suppression of national identities and cultures. Or, using less academic language, we could just say that the WEF and the UN-led push towards globalized one-world Marxism took it on the chin yesterday. Not a knockout blow, but still quite encouraging. Of course, the nattering nabobs of negativism will observe that the Brussels-based European Parliament is essentially a debarked lapdog and that all the decision-making power in the EU resides in the undemocratically appointed European Council and its woke European Commission President, Ursula von der Leyen, often derisively called Ursula von der Leyen due to her frequent spreading of COVID misinformation. And they would have a valid point, but Rome was not built in a day. And he goes on to say, during the time of the Biden presidency, in close alignment with the U.S. NATO policies, the majority of the ruling coalitions across Europe have moved far to the left, promoting open border, mass immigration policies, green new deals, stringent environmentalism, pro-pharma slash genetic vaccine mandates, free trade, and expanded defense commitments, including unquestioned support for aggressive military adventurism in Ukraine, as well as Russia. Um, 
Yesterday's European Parliament election results have made the stench of the failure of EU-backed globalist policies undeniable. Oh, I wish he was right. The persuadable middle of Europe is awakening from its psi war propaganda-induced hypnosis. The key question now on my mind is whether this foreshadows a populist surge here in these 50 not-so-united states. Thank you, Robert Malone, for those insights. Um, of course, the globalist progressives say it marks the end of democracy. Oh, please. That word is constantly misused and misapplied all across the media, all across the, the, the world, and has been for many years. It, it has like the kiss of the gods, democracy does, that word. A democratic election can put into power the most malevolent dictator. Hello. A communist nation can tout democratic elections, and the next thing you know, the media is saying, oh, the windows of change, the fresh air is blowing through this country. No, it's not. What are free and fair elections anyway? I don't know that we know anymore. Here's a question. Do the people have only have power on election day and not afterwards? Pfft, that's a good question. Do the people have power at all? And some would say, people that I respect on the side of uh, don't even bother to vote because, you know, the rig is in. And that's, that's a matter of conscience. So everyone needs to decide for themselves if they want to vote and who they want to vote for. And it's not a matter of division in the church at all. It's, it should never divide people, divide brethren. Because it's politics, and politics is temporary. You have two options, to look, look at the world through the prophetic lens or the political lens. And um, the prophetic lens, of course, as you know, is my preferred choice. And then I feel everything falls in line with, with prophecy and what we can know is happening. The political lens has value. As we do on days like this, there's value to looking at it for the political lens, but we have to apply the prophetic and the spiritual lens to it. Otherwise, it's just, uh, it's just a temporal thing, and, and it, we're spending a lot of time spinning our wheels over temporal things. Now, the U.S. might have democratic elections, yes, but we are a constitutional republic. We also have two different parties, Democrats and Republicans. Have you ever wondered what those titles really mean? There's a rabbit trail for you. So you can look that up if you want to. So keep an eye on the elections all over the world. They'll be going on until the end of the year. And we have time for a few more. Um, Russia, China dump the dollar as Moscow announces new trade corridors. Ooh, Moscow wants their hand in shaping global commerce. Russia announced this week that its bilateral trade with China has almost completely moved away from using the U.S. dollar, highlighting the two countries' commitment to reducing their reliance on U.S.-led economic system. I think he's been wanting to do that for a long time. It says, aside from reducing dependency on the Western-dominated global currency, these de-dollarization efforts allow Russia and China to avoid the myriad of sanctions now preventing Moscow from doing business on the international market. Poor Vladimir. Western sanctions have helped lead a boom in trade between Moscow and Beijing since 2022, rising 26% to $240 billion this year. China has also become the world's leading importer of Russian oil. De-dollarization isn't the only scheme Russia is deploying to avoid crushing sanctions. Russian officials announced last week at a UN, nation, uh, a UN meeting that the Kremlin is spending billions of dollars to dodge Western sanctions by developing new trade routes in Asia. The plan includes two new transport corridors, one that would link Russia to Kyrgyzstan via the Caspian Sea and another that would stretch from Belarus to Pakistan. The efforts build on previous plans to redirect trade, including a north-south corridor, a railway, railway route first conceived in 2000 that would connect Russia to the Indian Ocean via Iran. All these maneuverings around the world. And I know China's looking for new trade routes, too. 
After years of delays, Moscow loaned Tehran 1.3 billion euros last year to build its leg of the north-south route. Sergei Ivanov, Russia's presidential envoy for environmental issues, said that the corridor gives Russia full access to the Persian Gulf. Oh, interesting. And no sanctions will ever affect it. The newly announced routes would similarly allow Russia to bypass sanctions and access Asian markets. So we have the rise of the Eastern Hemisphere, even as we see uh, twilight of the Western Hemisphere. So that is fascinating to watch. Russia and Iran have also boosted their ability to transact with one another by linking their banking systems, as both face sanctions that limit their abilities to transact with the West. So uh, that is something to watch as Russia and China maneuver their economies and, and really make a big dent in the global economy. That, that's that's going to reverberate. BRICS and de-dollarization, how far can it go? As the current chair of BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South America, South Africa, sorry, Russia is pursuing a rather extensive agenda related to finance that includes enhancing the role of member countries in the international monetary and financial system and developing interbank cooperation and settlements in national currencies. Uh, BRICS has recently expanded, now includes Iran, Egypt, Ethiopia, and the uh, UAE. So um, that is something to watch. Just uh, sometimes we don't know what's going on financially until things start to go on financially, and by then connecting the dots really is, is very, very difficult. And that's why we try to stay on top of things as best we can so that you we can all connect some dots as to why things are going the way they're going. Reuters, Putin says Russia could deploy missiles, missiles in striking distance of the West. Um, Russian President Vlad said on Wednesday he could deploy conventional missiles within striking distance of the U.S. and its European allies if they allow Ukraine to strike deeper into Russia with long-range Western weapons. And I think there was a headline on that this morning, and I absolutely did not get a minute to even look at that. And he's saber-rattling, but... Um, there's a lot to lose if the U.S. Um, loses Iran, uh, Ukraine. So that's worth watching. I think Lindsey Graham had some comments on CBS this weekend about the great vast mineral deposits that we simply cannot afford to lose in the Ukraine. And I think he let some kind of cat out of some kind of bag. You might want to look that up. Um, he says, Putin says the West is wrong to assume Russia would never use nukes and the Kremlin's nuclear doctrine, doctrine should not be taken lightly. Um, and then uh, uh, let's just take a second here to talk about the hostages that were released. Wow. I don't know if you saw the footage of that uh, operation. But Gallant says, one of the most heroic operations I've ever seen. Defense Minister Yoav Gallant praised all the forces involved in Operation Arnon, the daring rescue of four hostages from uh, Nusrat over Shabbat weekend. Uh, that was really something to see if you haven't seen any footage on that. Oh. Uh, what, what do we all want besides all of them to come home? Uh, Druze News Syndicate says, is rescued Israeli hostages were in a state of severe malnutrition. They have been physically and mentally abused for a long time, a doctor who treated them said. JNS says, the four hostages rescued on Saturday after eight months in Gaza captivity are in a state of severe malnutrition. They have been physically and mentally abused. They are... Um, they are in a state of severe malnutrition, although it does not appear that way to them. Um, Dr. Ite Pisak, Pisak, director of the Edmund and Lily Safra Children's Hospital, told um, Israel on Monday. Um, I, was, I was struck by where they were being held. I guess the first question a lot of us has, were they held in a tunnel? And in our, in our minds, we don't really understand what, what even those tunnels are like or what they look like. And so we're trying to picture where these people are being held. It looked more like an apartment. I think it was a, a Gaza refugee camp, um, a dumpy apartment. This says they were being held in apartments in a densely populated residential area of Gaza. Um, the doctor explained that the medical condition of others who were held in the Hamas's tunnel network was much worse upon their liberation. Um, I think there's a significant difference, he says, but one cannot compare the suffering of one person to another. They all suffered from types of abuse, physical, mental, 
for a long time. Some 50, 250 people were kidnapped to Gaza during the October 7th onslaught with 116 remaining there. At least 40 considered no longer alive by Israelis. Two mentally ill Israelis crossed into Gaza on their own years ago and are also being held by the terrorists, as are the bodies of two IDF soldiers killed in the 2014 Gaza war. Ugh. 134 hostages have been returned to Israel, and I think everyone, every peace-loving, freedom-loving humanitarian in the world wants them all to go home. Um, and one, his father passed away uh, hours before he was uh, released. That is absolutely heartbreaking. He did not get to see. But, you know, uh, we have hope. Things are right on schedule when it comes to what the Lord is doing in the world. And we know that uh, God wins in the end. And so we have to endure some of these difficult times. But uh, it's just for a time and a season. Praise the Lord. All right, Thursday, Mike Abendroth. We're going to talk about suffering and cancer. Andy Woods on Friday. Hope you stay with me this week. Um, Wisdom and knowledge will be the stability of your times and the strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is our treasure.